best place to start is what happened over the weekend in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, people are maybe predicting a siege of Kabul, but that really didn't happen. And uh, from the time I record the show on Thursday, where I think I said 11 uh, of the capitals, uh, including Herat and Kandahar, had uh, either fallen or were surrounded at that time. Now, uh, essentially, the entirety of Afghanistan has fallen into the hands and control of the Taliban. So <laughs> what the hell happened? Yeah, man, I would say this last week in Afghanistan has been extremely eventful. And these last few days, especially, I think will probably go down as pretty important in the country's history. This is kind of a turning point in the last couple decades, at least. And, you know, I've gathered up a bunch of details and stuff about what's happened today. I may jump around a bit. So, yeah, feel, definitely feel free to interrupt me or jump in whenever you want. But um, earlier today uh, on Sunday when we're recording here, uh, the Taliban, as you said, did move into Kabul. They took the city. They took the national capital. The Afghan government has collapsed completely. Uh, most top officials, including the president, Ashraf Ghani, have fled the country, and the Taliban has taken over. Uh, they won this war, I think, in the most clear-cut way a military force can win a war, uh, you know, capturing the capital city and really uh, the, most of the rest of Afghanistan, for that matter, in these last few days. And um, people have been saying, I think quite aptly, comparing it to the fall of Saigon and Vietnam, um, and this all happened sort of very suddenly today in the space of just a few hours. Um, you know, you and I, we've been covering the Taliban offensive on these last the last few shows. Um, and starting maybe two weeks ago, uh, they really began tearing through all these provincial capitals. And we discussed maybe the first, as you said, five or eight or so on the show already. But by Saturday, that number had jumped to over 20 uh, provincial capitals they had taken. And then today, Sunday, they now pretty much control 100 percent of Afghanistan. Uh, people can see uh, this this chart we have up on screen, as well as some of the graphics we've been showing that just that, uh, you know, visually shows you just how much of the country they control. Um, Afghanistan has 34 provinces, and some of the reporting I've seen puts them in control of 32 or 33 of them. Um, there's only one pretty small regional capital that's left standing, the city called Bazarak, um, which historically is a stronghold of these anti-Taliban forces with uh, this group called the Northern Alliance, which has been one of the more U.S.-backed uh, warlord factions against the Taliban. However, by population, this town of Bazarak is very small. It's kind of a backwater. And, you know, we were talking off air that if the Taliban wanted it, they could probably contest it pretty quickly. Um, but otherwise, uh, in addition to Kabul, the Taliban has captured most or all of the important cities over the last few days. Uh, Kandahar, the second largest city, uh, Kunduz, Herat, Mazar Sharif, Jalalabad, uh, Lashkar Gah, all of the, the major cities in Afghanistan, every single one. Um, and again, yeah, people watching the video can see sort of just like the list of, of how many provinces have fallen just in the last week or two, as well as the dates on that chart. They can see just how quick that's that's all happened. It's uh, right. just in the space of a couple of weeks. And I mean, you could see, well, like the first dates are August 6th, August 7th, uh, three maybe on August 8th, one or two on the 9th. And then over between the 10th and the 15th, it, it's been the, almost the rest of the capitals again with maybe one outstanding at this point. It's it, it's been a, uh, I think, shocking and stunning to just about everyone, including the Biden administration, uh, including, I, I think, for most part, the U.S. intelligence it just agencies. I, I mean, I, I think on Friday of last week, we had uh, the, the Pentagon spokesperson, John Kirby, uh, say that, you know, the Kabul wasn't in, in imminent threat of danger, and yet it fell so quickly. And so... I mean, I, I'm sure there's still a lot of reporting left to be done here, but do we have any idea how the the offensive was completed so quickly? Well, the it seems that the Taliban mostly marched in Kabul, into Kabul without a fight. Um, like there were some reports of explosions around the city uh, when they were marching in there, but there didn't appear to be any big last stand by the government, uh, you know, to hold them back. Uh, just as with many of these other cities, it seems like they just folded and fled pretty quickly. And in fact, there was even some videos. Uh, going around showing these big convoys of Afghan troops. Uh, one of them, I think, was it purported to show them going over the border with into Iran uh, with all this UA, US made uh, uh, US made and supplied gear and vehicles and all this stuff. It was a big convoy of uh, trucks. Um, now, it's kind of interesting. The Taliban actually claimed that they did not plan on taking Kabul today. Um, they put out this big statement in Pashto saying that uh, the, the police and the military in Kabul had abandoned their posts. And so they're saying that they, uh, oh yeah, if people are watching the, the video version, they can see that's the that's the convoy of, of Afghan troops uh, fleeing out of the country. Uh, it's pretty uh, despicable. It's kind of a uh, just embarrassing show of, uh, you know, uh, fleeing. But, um, but anyway, yeah, the Taliban had put out this statement saying they did not intend on taking Kabul today, but that the security forces in the city, uh, you know, the government forces had fled and abandoned their posts. 
And so they say their version of events is that they moved into Kabul so that they could provide security and prevent like looting and riots and stuff. Again, that is their version of the story. Uh, I think the Afghan government has a, has a different uh, take on that. Um, however, the Taliban in that statement also insisted that nobody in Kabul has anything to fear from them. They're saying that like, you know, local Afghans, even ones who had worked with the governments, uh, the Western governments, as well as foreign nationals, that, you know, that they have nothing to fear, that they ordered their fighters to not bother people, to not enter anybody's homes. Now, I think the group has given these types of assurances before, and it has turned out in the past to not be true, where, like, you know, violence has occurred. But so far, I have not seen any major reports of, like, you know, uh, major violence or reprisals or a lot of the things that people have been fearing. Uh, it may still be kind of early to say, though. Like, this is all, you know, within the first 12 hours of them marching into the city. Um, now, in terms of the Afghan president, Ashraf Ghani, uh, he had reportedly fled the country uh, first to Tajikistan. And I know you had said that uh, later it was reported he was in Uzbekistan. Um, however, with him now gone, uh, the Taliban says that there will be no transitional government there, that like they just installed their new guy already. Uh, they declared a new president, uh, this guy, Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar. And uh, Baradar is actually a co-founder of the Afghan Taliban. He was at one point a top deputy to Mullah Omar, who's kind of like the OG Taliban founder and leader. And so this guy, Baradar, does have some pretty deep roots in the, the organization. Um, and one interesting thing that I was reading about him is that apparently he was captured in Pakistan uh, by Pakistani intelligence, the ISI, uh, back in 2010, but that he was released eight years later at the request of the United States. And they had said that they thought he might play some positive role in sort of the peace talks and the peace process there. So uh, that is the guy they put in charge. And I do believe he did take some role in the negotiations in Doha and Qatar. But uh, now he is apparently their new, uh, the new president. I'm not totally sure what's going on with uh, Akunzada, who I thought was like the, the top Taliban guy. But I don't know, maybe they just decided they want another political figurehead to, to be on the throne there in Kabul. Um, but that is, uh, that's a lot of the details I had for like the actual fall of Kabul. Um, I do have some stuff on like the evacuation efforts by the U.S., as well as sort of the, the Biden administration's response to all this. But um, I'll, I'll let you jump in anything in with anything that you had on Kabul, if, uh, you know, I, that's all about all I had there. Specifically. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess this is happening all over Afghanistan. They reported happening at the Bagram Air Base, which also fell to uh, the Taliban. That's a, that's a very interesting note that that air base ends up uh, falling so quickly after it was transferred to the control of the Afghan uh, military. Uh, but, you know, there's reports of uh, prisoners being released from a lot of prisons around Kabul and Bagram, uh, thousands, I guess, of former uh you know, Taliban fighters that are, I guess, current, even possibly Taliban fighters that were held captive uh, have now been released. And you could see different video of it. You could also see video of a lot of equipment at bases that the Taliban have captured. Now, I have seen some reporting. Well, that suggested that while it looks like, you know, that some of this equipment is is probably functional, it may be missing like parts, components and pieces. And that's why it got left behind is because it right. wasn't running for whatever reason at the time. And so there's pictures, with, you know, with Taliban and Black Hawk helicopters. I'm not sure any, if any of these Black Hawk, Hawk helicopters uh, can actually fly. You know, not to mention the fact that the Taliban probably can't, aren't trained on them and can't maintain them long term. Uh, you know, right. repair them into, you know, the, there's specific parts that you need that could be tricky to do, and maybe they figure out a way. But um, at, at the same time, there are a significant number of weapons that have fallen into Taliban hands, including weapons that are, you know, multi-million dollar weapon systems and 